Right. So. Welcome all and thank you for joining today's AWRI webinar. My name is Robin Dixon. I'm a senior viticulturist with the AWRI. In this session, we will look at irrigating vineyards with brackish groundwater. In the spirit of reconciliation, the AWRI acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. I would also like to acknowledge Wine Australia for providing funding and support for webinars via the AWRI Extension Project. Before we jump in and make a start, we've got a couple of quick reminders to anyone who's new to AWRI webinars. If you would like to provide a comment or ask a question um, during the webinar, just click on the Q&A button um, at the bottom of the Zoom toolbar, type in your question and click send, um, and it'll send through. So we'll be holding the Q&A session at the end of the presentations, but you can send through your questions at any stage. Also a reminder that the session is being recorded and a link will be sent through to you later via the AWRI's YouTube channel. So for anyone who's just joined, welcome. Today's webinar topic is irrigating vineyards with brackish groundwater. And today we will be joined by Michael Cutting and Dr. Paul Petrie. And for the Q&A session, we will also be joined by Dr. Vinod Fogart. Sorry, excuse me. Uh, so first up, we have Michael Cutting. So Michael is the team leader of land and water management with the Murray Lands and Riverland Landscape Board based at Murray Bridge. In his role, Michael oversees the land Landscape Board's sustainable water use and sustainable agriculture programs. So if you're ready, Michael, I'll hand over to you now. No worries. Thanks, Robin, and uh, thanks everyone for joining us today. It's uh, good to see some good numbers um, in the participant uh, list. So um, I'm just going to start off with a little bit of background and context to the project um, before I hand over to Paul. Um, so Paul, if you can just flick on to the uh, next slide, please. Sorry, Paul's driving the slide. So um, as we're all probably aware, um, the Lower Murray, as much as we're currently in a period of um, yeah, very high flows and coming off the back of that. Um, so water quality and water quantum um, are both very good at the moment. We know only too well um, that uh, yeah, we remain susceptible to drought and um, as much as we put mitigation measures in place to try and manage that, um, yeah, we certainly have learned a lot from, from, the, from the, the Millennium Drought experience. So, and some of those learnings, I guess, have been incorporated into what we're going to talk about today. So um, next slide, please, Paul. So this is just a, a graphical representation of the, the Lake Alexandra in water levels. Um, you can see at the peak of the millennium drought, um, you'd see normal pool level is generally around 0.75 AHD, so 75 centimetres above um, sea level. But you can see, yeah, in 2009 that um, the, the water level in Lake Alexandrina really um, bottomed out and if you overlaid that um, with the water quality, um, the, yeah, the water quality went um, well above 5,000 EC units as well. So um, hopefully we don't see a return of that, but um, as, as we mentioned, um, we certainly have learned a lot from going through that and hopefully yeah, we can build on some of that moving forward if we do happen to unfortunately experience that again. So thanks, Paul. Um, so this is a graph of the um, salinity impacts of um, that water quality. So um, looking at the, on the, the bottom axis there, you can see the time frame. So you, 
you can see um, in the teal diamond, you can see the water quality there for Lake Alexandrina. So you can see um, it was above that 5,000 EC units or five deci Siemens. Um, and you can see the impact that that's had on, on root zone salinity. So um, around that 2007, eight period, you can see at 30 centimetres, 60 centimetres and 90 centimetres, the soil water contents there. Um, you can see the dashed red line being the salinity production threshold for vine. So you can see um, even at all levels, so the three levels that um, the soil water content in terms of its uh, EC levels far exceeded that. And at depth, um, you had levels um, at 15, 15 deci siemens a metre. So um, that's uh, yeah, far exceeding the threshold for salinity tolerance, um, even for the reduced yielding vines, which we tend to see um, in production down at Langhorne Creek and in some of the more premium wine grape growing regions. Um, so thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, so the Millennium Drought uh, did obviously prompt um, some investment in some infrastructure to try and overcome that, recognising that, um, that, yeah, we will experience that again. It's just a matter of when. Um, and so one of the key, uh, I guess, adaptation or mitigation measures for, for Langhorn Creek and Currency Creek for that matter, um, was the investment in the Creek's pipeline company. So you can see the picture there is um, of their offtake point at Jervois. Uh, so just for context, Jervois is um, on the other side of the river from Tatum Bend. So upstream um, in the river channel. So we tend to experience better water qualities at that, that point in the river. Um, so that's, yeah, had a big benefit uh, since the Millennium Drought, we've been fortunate that we've had um, pretty reliable water availability in terms of irrig irrigation allocations on the River Murray. Um, but again, it's well and good to have a pipeline, but when we do reduce, or when we do receive reduced irrigation allocations, um, yeah, you still need water to put through a pipeline. So hence this project um, has been looking at some of the alternatives around um, when water, water availability um, isn't where we'd like it to be on the River Murray system. So, um, and yeah, we just pose that question, will the um, availability um, meet the demand going forward? So um, Kim, so the project work here was done at Kim Bolton Wines at their Montrose vineyard. So uh, not the cellar door vineyard, but down on uh, Lake Plains Road. Um, so the CP seawater or Creeks pipeline has greatly assisted the vineyard. But one of the biggest challenges from a, a water management point of view was the low flow rate at the property. So, um, because of that, the irrigation schedule was dictated by um, the flow rate. And so they had 13 shifts across 36 hectares. And so um, it took two days to, to get around the vineyard. Obviously, uh, that had its uh, disadvantages, particularly during heat waves, because they couldn't get back around the vineyard quick enough. And uh, that had the resultant um, impact of lost fruit, um, both in terms of quantum as well as quality during during the heat wave event. So they were quite keen on trying to overcome that. And I guess you can never really make your, your property completely drought proof. But um, as part of that, um, through uh, one of the Commonwealth government funded programs, which the, the landscape board was delivering um, in partnership with the Commonwealth, so the water efficiency program. So this was one of the programs that was linked under the Murray-Darling Basin um, plan with water recovery. So as part of um, being able to access this funding, um, we needed to develop a, a water savings um, uh, proposition, um, which then supported uh, the, the investment. So initially the thinking was around um, the on-farm storage providing some management efficiencies. We often hear a lot of negativity around dam construction, um, but these dams have, are turkiness dams and they're not designed to intercept any overland flows. They're essentially just a holding mechanism um, for, the, for the licensed, um, both the surface water and they choose to, to store that in there. So the main benefit that the dam was providing from a management point of view was the increased flow rate. So as you can see there, they went from 13 shifts down to four. So all of a sudden they're able to manage things, not in real time, but I guess be um, far more adaptive than they were previously um, increased. And um, that certainly has provided some significant opportunities to, to make better use of um, rainfall events and to also be more proactive around heat wave management. So um, traditionally they would have um, looked at the longer term forecast in terms of three or four days out, knowing that their system had limitations in keeping up and therefore 
they would commence irrigating ahead of a heat wave. And then if that heat wave didn't eventuate or if there was a rainfall event that was forecast, um, th there wasn't the confidence not to irrigate um, because the system didn't have the capacity to, to keep up, if you like, um, if that um, irrigation event was delayed on the presumption that that rainfall event would occur. So um, I'll leave it there. That's um, the background. Um, I'll hand over to Paul um, to talk about some of the, the, um, the, the modelling um, work itself. So thanks, Paul. Oh, sorry, I'll hand over to Robin. Sorry, Robin, I'm getting my, my um, no order incorrect. No worries at all. Thank you, Michael. Um, and now, as Michael said, we'll be handing over to um, Dr. Paul Petrie. So Dr. Paul Petrie is the Principal Scientist in Viticulture and Program Manager of Irrigated Crops, the Irrigated Crops Group at South Australian Research and Development Institute. Paul leads a viticultural research program aiming to improve the resilience of Australian vineyards improving their productivity and ability to adapt to climate change. So his work has focused on strategies to better manage dry winters and to understand and manage vintage, vintage compression. So thank you, Paul. I'll hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Robin. So I suppose following along from, from Michael, um, the... In this, in the in the context of have a, a drought or lower water allocations, um, the Langhorn Creek region has quite a, a large ground water resource that's available, about six gigalitres, um, and it this currently is, um, is is not usually utilised. Um, often it's accessible because um, the the vineyards or the farms previously um, were, were were using that water, so there's bores in place. Um, and potentially in years of, of low allocation, it can be a cheaper and alternative um, of source of water. However, the, the drawback or the, the downside to it is that most of this water has um, is, is salty or brackish. It has a, um, a, a salt content with it um, and that that salt content would, would preclude or often preclude it from being used as, as for irrigation, especially as a, um, you know, a, a sole source of irrigation. Um, sorry. The other thing, as part of the infrastructure that was put on um, established at Kimbolton Wines, um, it, that would allow them to access this groundwater um, and shandy it or process it as into the into the irrigation system. So effectively, this gives them another option of. Um, uh, to another water access option. However, they have to, um, I say, manage the salt risk or know what the what, what's involved with the salt risk if they were going to start using that that water source. Um, so, you know, the downsides of the the, the brackish water, um, and I'm sure a lot of you are, are familiar have observed these. Um, you get um, salt build up in the in the profile um, that can can reduce canopy growth. Um, it can lead to some um, defoliation. Potentially, it can reduce yield. Um, so, you know, through poor poor production for poor production the following season, um, it can impact on juice quality. And so, salt can you, know, you can end up with with salty flavored fruit or salty flavored rot wine. And some of our uh, export markets have quite low tolerances to salt in the in the wine, and so it can be, a, I suppose, an impediment to the to the sale of that that fruit and it can um, lead to some soil structural breakdown so the um, the clay particles can um, can disperse and um, and that's very hard to, to to counteract so you don't want to be using the salty or taking the the, the use of the salty water lightly um, and part of this project was basically to understand what the the risks were or how we might manage those risks so if we're um, yeah use the salty water carefully, um, we it, yeah so it's, it's a resource that that we can access and especially a resource that that might be really valuable if the water allocations have been cut. So um, you know things we want to consider is if we can apply to avoid times when the crops are are. Um, crops more sensitive. So maybe if it's more sensitive to flowering, you'd be better to use your your sweet water or your freshwater resource then. Um, there's risk profile will vary with different soil types. So uh, a sandy soil might be able to tolerate more um, salt because 
it is easier for the salt to leach through that system. Um, and as part of this project, we basically did a, a sensitivity analysis of what it would look like for, for the application of, of these different water sources. So I'm, I'm modeling exercise looking at water sourced from um, the, the groundwater and the surface water and then some different um, environmental um, considerations as well. Um, so if we are able to um, show or, or demonstrate a scenario that would allow us to um, utilize this groundwater, that means that the, um, you know, the, the, the growers at Kimbolton would have better confidence in, in, in accessing it and using it, especially during a drought. Um, and we used a, a numerical model to, to uh, investigate this. So as inputs um, into the model, we had a, um, a, a series of, of field measurements that we did. Um, we some some climate measurements over both the, the season that we were, were doing the direct assessments and the um, some historic measures. Um, we used the irrigation schedule that that um, that Kim, Kim Bolton Wine were, well, we based our modeling on somewhat on the irrigation schedule that Kim Bolton Wine were using. Um, we did an assessment of the some of the so soil, so some soil um, some soil metrics. We monitored soil moisture, um, and we basically just used the existing soil moisture probe that they had had installed. Um, we came and did some um, some soil and some root zone um, soil moisture, uh, sorry, uh, salinity assessments. So that's thing using a, a thing called a, a soil water extractor, or one of the trade names is a, a soil sampler. And basically, you, you suck a, a sample of, of water out of the soil to measure its salinity. And we assessed the, the, the canopy size, so the canopy growth, because we know that this is a major driver of um, how much water the vines are using. Um, so we took those those field measures that we've talked about, and we put them into a um, into a model. Um, the model was run in in, in two parts. Um, the the first part was the um, the vine evapotranspiration or the water use. Uh, we call that um, an FA, the FAO fifty six model there on the on the slide. And basically, that estimates how much water those those vines need or are, are using on a daily basis. Um, it's driven by things like the, the temperature and the wind speed, um, the rainfall and the and the light. Um, we also uh, modeled the salt or the salinity and the moisture in the soil. Um, and we used a, a model called Hydrus to do that. And that um, that box with the the, um, the colored sections below the vine in the picture is an example of the output of, of the hydrus model. And I'll show that in, in some more details for some of the scenarios in a, in a couple of slides. So we we came up with a range of scenarios. One of the good things about um, about modeling is that it allows you to test a lot of different scenarios more than we could ever test if we were trying to run this as a as an experiment. There'd just be be too many options. Whereas the model allows us to sort of investigate a, a, a range of options or a range of opportunities that that, that the growers could use. Um, so we came up with, um, I suppose, a range of, of of sixteen that we modeled as part of these these scenarios. So we had um four levels of rainfall uh sorry four levels four water sources probably is a better description um so we had water from the river this is the the sweet the good quality water um we had water that was shandied um 50 50 between the river and the groundwater um the groundwater at the site of the estimate that we used for this site was um 3.2 um deci salmons and we had an, um, another one where we had alternating. So basically that was one irrigation with the river water, the next one with the groundwater and swapping back and forth and back and forth. Um, on top of that, we had two, um, some other environmental scenarios. So we had rainfall based on the, um, the average, sort of the long term or the, the average over the, the, the period that we ran the, ran the model, which was um, four or five years. And then we said, okay, if we have dry seasons, we're about 80% of that average. Um, as a as a as an example for a, um, a dry scenario, and then we looked at at leaching. So leachings are, and I'll talk a bit more about it later again. But leachings are major or an important practice to help manage salinity in your in your vineyard. We would normally recommend that a leaching irrigation is applied 
um, and in spring or at the end of winter um, prior to bud burst. And we recommend this because that's when the soil profile is full. So nice full soil profile, then you can add your leaching irrigation and that pushes the salts out of the profile. If you try and apply that leaching irrigation into an empty profile, say you want to, you, you look to do it at the, um, just post harvest at the end of the season, that profile is empty and most of the water that you want to use for leaching will actually just be, um, uh, will will accumulate in the soil, so it doesn't actually push the um, push through the profile and 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 take the cells with it. Okay, so here is an example of the the hydrus model output at the at the bottom of the of the screen there, and we're contrasting the two um, I suppose the two extreme scenarios or two of the more extreme scenarios. We've got scenario one, which is irrigation with the river water, and we've got scenario six and 100% um, normal normal rainfall. And we've got scenario 16, which was irrigation with the groundwater and 80% of the average rainfall. And as we can see, this is a the the time step over the the years of the um, that we ran the model. Um, the the red is the more saline zone, through to the blue, which is the the less saline zone. And as we can see, as this sort of steps through over time, that the um, the scenario 16 has a lot larger um, you know, part of that that square box that represents the root zone. Um, is is um, showing that that is a lot more salty. Um, this effectively this is a this is a two dimensional um, view of the um, of the vineyard. So you've got the vine row in the middle, and then on each side it goes out and models out to the out to the mid row. So if we look at the results of that that model run um, over the uh, between uh, 2017 and 2022, which was the period that we we ran the um, we ran the model for, um, and we just start off with um, with with four of the scenarios. So once again, the more um, the more extreme scenarios. Um, we've got the the red line, the dashed red line there, which is the um, the the sense salinity sensitivity threshold for vines. So we would generally say that vines grown above that threshold will have some symptoms of salt stress. Now that doesn't mean that you you can't grow a, grow a vineyard um, at, at greater salinities than that. You certainly can, but we would say that the 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 salt is likely to start to have an impact on the on the vines. Um, at that point, um, I suppose the first up the comment would be that even with the um, the the river water, the higher quality water, we are still sitting quite close to that to that threshold um, throughout the, the 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 five years of the um, or the sorry the six years of the model run. Um, however, if we compare that to the, the that's the blue lines the um, with the the river water. If we compare that to the uh, the red lines, which are the the groundwater, we can see that especially over those first three years of the um, the model that the salt in the soil builds up quite dramatically over time. Um, so what we don't have on this graph, but is also relevant is the, is the rainfall, both the in-season rainfall and the, um, the rainfall during wintertime. Um, the in-season rainfall reduces the irrigation demand, so we're not putting as much salt into the system. And then the um, rainfall during winter especially helps leach and helps wash and move those salts out of the profile. So the first three or four years of the um, the model run were relatively dry, and that's why we see that build up of salt um, across those those seasons. You can also see the impact of the the actual irrigation season, especially in the in those top two lines. Is like quite a there'll be quite a steep increase. Um, then it will it will. Um, Sort of flatten out for a little bit, and then as we get the rainfall during winter, those, some of those salts, um, those salts leach out. Um, the other interesting contrast here is between the the leaching and the um, the non leaching uh, management practice. So the leaching was, uh, I mean, it didn't, it didn't solve the issue for the groundwater, but it certainly helped in that, and even for the um, the river water source that the, um, the salt in the profile when that leaching irrigation was applied um, at the end of the five years was significantly less than um, if we hadn't been using that leaching irrigation. Um, if we put a couple other um, 
examples, a couple of other scenarios on this graph. Um, so this is the blended, um, the blended treatment and um, plus or minus drought and then plus or minus leaching. So um, what that's telling us is that the blending is certainly better than just using straight groundwater, but that it was still um, resulted in some salt or quite a lot of salt accumulation during the course of the, the model run. Um, what we can see though, is that when we applied the leaching irrigation, that that made once again, a quite a significant improvement. And if you refer to the, the sort of the green line um, that it, while it wasn't perfect, it kept that salinity at a, you know, a, a lower level. And that may be, a, a, I suppose, a tolerable level, not an ideal level, but a tolerable level for a vineyard, especially if the, um, you know, if the, the price of water or water availability is reduced or restricted. So I suppose the, the, the key messages or the, the take home messages here are that the, um, you can use the, the brackish or the moderately saline groundwater to help um, negotiate or help mitigate water shortage during a drought. However, we've got to be really careful when we're, we're doing this. Um, we, you know, you probably couldn't use it by itself. You probably still need to blend it with a, an alternate water source, a better quality water source. Um, you'd want to monitor your soil salinity pretty carefully, and you'd need that, you know, that that, ir that leaching irrigation becomes even more important because you're bringing a lot more salt into your system. So you've got to try and um, you've got to try and push it out. Uh, the winter rainfall um, improved leaching, so you know, um, a, a wet winter will um, allow you to accommodate the use of um, a lot more of that saline groundwater. But in the end, the either saline groundwater in itself or saline groundwater blended with a um, with the river water probably still isn't really a long term solution in this situation. It's something that you might be able to get away with for a for a season or two, but it's probably going to be a pretty challenging thing to try and try and run your vineyard on that um, on that water blend for a um, you know for for a number of years. Um, I suppose next so up just to, to reinforce how critical the, the leaching is um, and that it's a um, yeah the, the the leaching was done with the the, um, the the river water and so basically we were pushing the salts out with with that clean that good quality water salt source. Um, we do that one prior to the growing season. Um, as I said earlier, um, it's more effective when you have a full profile to start with and you um that's the the time when the profile is likely to be at its at its fullest the soil profile has the most moisture in it uh, and the the um soil can better tolerate the, the poor quality irrigation water if it's um if it's been flushed or if it's been leached at the start of the season um, so finally um just to acknowledge our um our collaborators in this project um obviously michael that um, we had the introduction from but also nicole clark and jenny venus at, at, at kim vulcan wines um for allowing us to to access their vineyard for apply um providing us with a whole lot of historical information around irrigation schedules and um soil moisture um uh, soil moisture results, and also to the to the federal government, to the Department of Agriculture, Fisheries and Forestry, um, through their land care grant that they um, provided to support this research. So, thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, now, I'd like to invite um, Michael to join us for the Q&A. And uh, we also have uh, Vinod Fogart um, joining us, Dr. Vinod Fogart joining us as well for the Q&A. So Vinod is a senior research officer at um, Persa Saadi um, and an affiliate senior lecturer at, at the University of Adelaide. And he has a huge amount of experience um, and training on pressurized irrigation systems in Israel. And he's been with Saudi since 2011, and he's been working on the advance advancement of best practices with irrigated crops. So thank you for joining us, uh, Vinod. Uh, we have a question here. Thanks, 
Thanks, Robin, for nice words spoken for me. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Alex Sass from One Australia has said, good project. Any idea on cost of diesel per megalitre? Okay. Um, so I, we've been doing a little bit of work um, as part of another project um, in, the, in the One Basin CRC. Um, and it is, um, that is a bit of a, how long is a piece of string question. Um, it depends on what quality the water is when it comes in um, and what quality you're targeting at the, at the end of the process, or if you sort of, you, um, yeah, what quality you're targeting at the end of the process and also what sort of extraction rate you're after. So if you're only trying to, to take, um, yeah, 30, so if you've got a, a stream of a water supply and you only need 30% of that for irrigation and you can afford to leave the other 70% as the, the more salty brine, um, it's a lot cheaper to run a desal plant than if you're trying to get 80 or 90% of the, the water out of that, um, that water supply and you only want to leave 10 or 20% as brine. Some of the figures I've seen quoted um, get down to sort of one or two hundred dollars a megalitre, but I'd say it depends a lot on the on the situation. Uh, I don't, Michael. Do you have any more any more comments on that? No, I probably don't have a whole lot more to add to that. But yeah, I guess just reinforcing what you said. It often it comes down to water quality. So through the um, the one basin project you referred to. Um, in terms of resource availability, the obvious one in the Riverlands often that's often talked about is the salt interception scheme water. Um, it's an order of magnitude saltier than what we're dealing with here at Langon Creek. So um, yeah, it obviously has greater cost to treat um, and therefore the, the financial viability of that is probably different. Um, but desal technology as a whole has definitely come down in cost. Um, so, um, yeah, I guess it continues on that trajectory and it all comes back at the moment. Obviously, River Murray water's in, in surplus and very cheap. So the drivers for people to do these things at the moment, but um, yeah, isn't necessarily there, but uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, but I mean, I am aware of at least one vineyard that is um, is irrigating or has access to um, desalinated water for, for irrigation and, and uses that when the, when the water price um, uh, sort of um, supports it. Um, and I'm sure we'll see more of it um, yeah, in, in other regions too. Okay, thank you. Uh, now on to Randolph Bowen. Um, what volume of water is required for a leaching irrigation? Uh, Paul? Well, I'm going to pass that to to, to Vinod. Vinod, what? Um, how much water did you you model or put it to the model to as your leaching irrigation? Did you have a set amount or did you um, vary it between seasons? No, it's a, a fixed amount, thirty mils uh, in the before the bird burst in the early in the season. So thirty mils of leaching irrigation was applied for the for leaching scenarios. Um, so the volume of water required for the leaching or the, the process for, for um, the leaching irrigation would vary depending on, on the soil type. Um, so is there information um, that growers can access about how to determine the leaching, best leaching practice for their particular vineyard? Yeah, because that's, that's the things to just um, explore further in this um, direction, because we have done on the, uh, only on the site specific soil conditions. So on that site, what kind of soils we have got, it was on the top, it was sandy, uh, loamy sand to sandy loam, and that the lower end, it was sandy clay loam to clay loam. So this was a typical soil at the site. and. In, on that soils, we have the, this kind of um, leaching events we have um, studied. For other soils, um, we didn't uh, done any sensitivity analysis. Um, but uh, of course, if we have some more funding from any other, other source, we can go for that because already we have model established for that site. And we can introduce this uh, soils 
the different soil taxes and soil physical parameters changes in the physical physical and and if a, if and but questions regarding soils climate or maybe growing condition management condition we can do anything so this is what um, within the time and the resources uh, only we have done for this specific soils okay um Vinod, another question um, related to the graph um, that Paul showed that um, showed the impact of the leaching um, in the dry dry years and in the wetter years. It, it seemed that in the drier years, that leaching um, practice really had quite a minimal impact on um, the amount of salt, whereas when there was a, a wetter season, the, the leaching had a much bigger impact. So um, is that a real story to tell that when you have a wet season, it's a real opportunity to um, try and reduce some of those salts uh, that have built up in the soil? Um, uh, is, is that fair to say? Yeah, you are right, Robin, because if you see um, during the first three years, uh, 17, 18 and 19, the rainfall was quite less in 17, it was around 320 and then in 18, 19, it was 280 and in 19, it was also around 320. So that's below average rainfall of that region. So if you see the average rainfall of last 100 years of that's at that site, or within that region, it is around 370 to 390 mils. So it's quite low as compared to the average rain for the first three years. And, and if you see the intensity of the rain events, because that is quite important for the leaching of the soil. So intensity means amount of rain for a particular day. So when you see those things, then I was, uh, it was found that during 2017 and 18, there was not a single rain that exceeds 20 mil. So, so there was not a push off, a kind of thing for the SARS to just leach out of the system. Uh, that's why they are building during the three years. And in the fourth years, the rainfall was about 500 mils. So that was above the hours and the big rain events were about five, so more than 20 mils rain events were five. So they played a crucial role in leaching the SARS um, out of the system. So if we have less rainfall, so your soil is already not filled with, at not at the saturation point, maybe the water, holding um, capacity or with, within the soils, it's not at the saturation level, if you see at the time of the um, post winter seasons. So that's the crucial time when we see our soils, if it is, uh, you can see if winter rainfall is less than ours, then definitely the growers should go for this leaching irrigation. Um, and if winter rainfall is sufficient, like 500, mills it may um uh, it may help still help in leaching the soils so depending on the soil type what kind of soils they have got if they have a heavy texture they may not be able to push those soils so it um it depends on the soil types and the rainfall condition um so the, for driving the salt out of the system okay thank you and um Continuing on with that topic, Mango Parker from the AWRI has asked, um, does the model account for different soil types? Yeah, at that site, we had different soil textural layers, like four different textural layers with depth. So that we have accounted for, for that particular site, but for other sites, we haven't done anything. Okay. Yeah, so so you need to set the model up for each soil type. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you can't sort of yeah, yeah. Take, take the example from one site and then 
say, oh, yeah. well, that will work on, a, on, a, on another site or another region. You need some, at least some, some more soil information to give it some context. Yeah, so based on the soil information, based on your measurement, uh, like moisture dynamics uh, or um, moisture content measurement at the site and soil salinity measurements, you have to calibrate your model for that particular site. Calibration means your model is producing the results, whatever you are getting at the sites. Then you are saying, okay, you have confident on, confidence on that. And then you can run on different things, if and bursts and long-term and short-term different kind of thing for that particular site. If you are moving to the different soils, different um, climate, different weather condition, different crop, then you have to again calibrate this model. Um, but you can do the sensitivity analysis, just changing the things. So um, we haven't done that, but that is flex that is um, that is doable if there is some more funding or there is um, some more um, interest from the growers or some other funding bodies. And um, onto the soil type, um, I think you did mention it, but what was the soil type in this particular um, vineyard? So uh, we have estimated the soil uh, physical parameters, hydraulic parameters. At this particular site, the, um, um, there are four layers uh, at the, um, from zero to 15 centimeters, soil is loamy sand and the 15 to 30 sandy loam. Uh, and then 30 to 60, it's still sandy loam, but then there is, clay um, kind of mix with sand and it's a sandy clay loam texture. And if you go, I'm not sure, but I have uh, read uh, different textures of that region, like 25 different soil textures, they, they exist in that region. So at deeper depths, it's, it's always heavy texture soils. Uh, and that, that drives the movement of the salts and water out of the system. Yeah. So we have estimated the hydraulic conductivity and all that stuff and um, hydraulic parameters, which are the basic input for this model. Um, we have estimated um, solute parameters and a range of things uh, for the soils, for the uh, crop, we have estimated the uh, uh, canopy growth, um, LAI and DVI, uh, many things, and they have put in both two models, and then we have calibrated this model for this particular site, and that particular crop, and that particular uh, climate condition. Okay, um, just on this model, so you looked at a 50-50 shandy between the groundwater and the irrigation water did you look at different ratios to see if there was a, a more of a sweet spot yeah that's again uh, doable but uh, because we we didn't have much time to do that so and funding so far for uh, doing this job was only uh, one year and modeling component only three months so it was very short time to do the things. So we can do a lot of things. So both um, your, um, uh, whatever you're asking, we can do all of these, these okay. things for it. <laughs> just need the money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we need the money and time. So. Okay. Um, and Neil has a question about um, ground truthing the, the models. So yeah, did you do um, field checking um, to see, uh, to check the accurate accuracy of the model? Yeah, so we have compared the moisture dynamics, daily moisture balance in the soil profile um, with the measured values. So we have we had the measured values, we have the model model values, and we have compared those things. Um, so that is known as the calibration part of the model. So we have to calibrate our model on the measured set of conditions. So we have done that, and that's why we are saying this. Then we run this model on five years, uh, and and that's that's because model means you have a lot of equations, background equations that are they are working, and then you have to accommodate or you have to just um, uh, calibrate those all of them with the field conditions. So what kind of condition we have got? We have measured the 
um, water content dynamics in the soil system. We also measured the um, salinity. Um, uh, we had soil samplers at a couple of locations over there, and we also took the soil samples for salinity measurements. So we have done a lot of uh, field measurements to uh, calibrate this model. So that has been done. Hmm. All right. So it's... we are coming with a paper, and we have we have explained everything in that. So that is coming. Okay. Excellent. Thank you. Um, and there's a question about the influence of inter-row cover crop species, um, and um, their impact on, I guess, how um, how these crops use the saline irrigation water and their tolerance um, to these this saline water. So, yeah, because we haven't done this, uh, this was not the objective of this project, but this is again, this is again doable. Um, um, and because the, we have done this on the um, trip irrigation system and we are irrigating on just close to the vine on a partially wetted uh, kind of surface. So we, we haven't um, consider the mid row for the crops. So that is um, that is evaporation zone or uh, atmospheric condition. So we can do that. And then it will be a dual cropping kind of system we have to deal with. So th that is doable, a bit complex, but we haven't done that. So broadly, we would expect the cover crop to use water during winter time. So it's a yeah, you know, it would it would grow and it will transpire water during winter time. And if there is too much cover crop there, then it will use water that would otherwise be able to leach the salts out of the system. So you have to be careful that the um, the cover crop doesn't, um, I suppose, lead to an, an increase or an increase in the accumulation of salt. But as as Vinod said, to really sort of check and understand that the dynamics of that, you would have to um, you know sort of develop it into the model. Mm, okay. Uh, so. Again, on the leaching um, process. So, what um, was that? Thirty um, mil uh, millimeters, wasn't it? Thirty millimeters of leaching irrigation per hectare. Um, yeah. Was that applied in one irrigation or? Yeah, that's one continuous irrigation, and that is. Uh based on the dripper system that is the, the this irrigation system designed for this, that particular property. So that was 2.3 um, liter per hour. On that basis, we have uh, applied this 30 mils of water. Okay. So actual real um, irrigation system designed for that particular size, so we have adopted all those stuffs, all those, all those um, parameters. And uh, those shared shared by the uh, Kim Bolton. Um, so their irrigation schedule, what kind of irrigation schedule they have applied for the last five years? We have introduced every um, all of them uh, with their uh, irrigation uh, discharge rate and everything is done on the basis of the um, real um, the real uh, water application rate applied by the involvement. Okay. Yeah. All right. Excellent. Uh, so there's a paper that will be um, published. Um, where can people find this paper? Uh, I'm... So the paper is not, um, it's, it is, it hasn't been published yet. There is a report um, and I don't, know for sure if that's publicly available yet so that's gone to the funding body and I'd need to confirm if it's um if it's been released um if it has been released um as you just I'm going to get advice on that my phone a friend is going to tell me the answer here very quickly I can I can see it coming on my phone yes um if it is made available can we put a um a link as part of the the, the follow-up to the to the presentation so it yes. can be distributed yeah, so we when we send out the recording, we can also send out um, the paper. Okay. Um, yep, so people can watch what okay. so so we'll confirm we need to confirm that we're able to release it, but if we are able to release it, then we can we can do that. 
Okay. Um, and there's just one sneaky quick question. Can you expect a difference between drip irrigation and underground irrigation in terms of salinity uh, implications since the lower surface evaporation might reduce concentration effect? Yeah, so this is again interesting, you know, interesting question, I think. So surface and uh, subsurface, we have done, uh, a, a, uh, we have published a paper on that, and um, uh, we have also improved the FAO 56 methodology, food and agriculture organization um, uh, methodology for irrigation requirement for subsurface strip irrigation system estimation of the evaporation. So uh, for the subsurface strip irrigation, evaporation um, uh, from the subsurface and surface, it's almost similar. It's surprising if it's a subsurface is seated uh, at 30 centimeter or lower depth from the surface. So, so that's there. So it's quite surprising, um, but it's, 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 it is true, I think. So um, if you compare those, um, it, Again, it's a lot of things uh, matters like what kind of soils we have got, what, what and uh, what kind of the connection, uh, capillary connection we have got because capillary connection and the evaporative flex that is working on the surface that drives water through the capillary, capillaries on the surface. So if that is capillary or uh, evaporative flex is quite high, then it can drive water from 30 centimeters. So that's similar to surface or 30 centimeters. So if the um, if the water content is limiting and evaporative flux is more, then the conditions that we have during the summer, so then the subsurface drip and surface drip, they are almost similar. Okay. All yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you very much um, to all of you for um, your presentations today and Vinod for joining, joining us for the Q&A. Um, so our, um, the next series of webinars will start next financial year. Um, so watch out for the e-bulletin that will be advertising those um, towards the end of this financial year. If you do have any uh, topics that you would really love to hear more about, um, we'd love to hear from you. So you can um, just drop us a line um, via help desk. So it's helpdesk at awri.com.au. Uh, and we'll look at uh, including those into the next series. Uh, thank you again, everyone, for participating. Look forward to seeing you at the next webinar. Thanks a lot, Robin. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. Thanks, everyone.